nearly 300 buildings destroyed, millions of dollars in property damage, multiple first responders injured. It's been called the largest arson case in the history of the country, and it could have been worse. They were so lucky that no one died. We would not have had any plea deals with anybody involved in the conspiracy with a fatality. That conspiracy cooked up by a group that included police officers and a firefighter. Given the fact that we live in a post 9-11 world, a post Boston Marathon bombing world, we would consider these individuals domestic terrorists. State Fire Marshal Peter Ostrowski says a simple takeaway from the case is the importance of vigilance by the public, like the efforts of photographer Nat Whittemore, who captured video of the arson suspects. Since then, that's been a tool that's been utilized by fire departments and fire investigators for a long time, looking at photographs, whether it be from the media, from bystanders. But boy, arson investigations have evolved. We train everybody from recruits on through the department, and we have a lot of teamwork that takes place between local entities like law enforcement and fire service that come together to bring these to a successful conclusion. While the city has changed and memories of the fires fade, nearly 40 years later, the emotions of those involved still smolder. You get the right mix of the wrong people. They got together and they started doing bad things. The city was under attack in 1982. The only way to get people rehired was to basically terrorize the city. That was the ostensible motive that Grobolewski said. But I think over time, as firefighters began to be rehired, then they just continued it because they couldn't stop because it was a form of entertainment for them. Chronicle reached Greg Bemis, who set many of the fires. While he did not agree to an on-camera interview, he did respond with his thoughts on the arson conspiracy of which he was a part, saying, quote, I personally felt bad about the injuries, but until the E Street military barracks fire, most of the injuries were minor in nature, and the members of the group of us foolishly rationalized that the good overrode the bad. In retrospect, that was my greatest regret. I truly believe to this day that the cutbacks would have been much worse and the passage of the Traeger bill would not have happened had it not been for our regrettable actions some 35 years ago. Wayne Miller hopes telling the story will help a new generation learn from the past. Lessons for the city of Boston and for cities around the country to respect your municipal workers, your firefighters, and your police, not to use them as political pawns when the money is short. Some people just don't like the government, so they might believe that it was the right thing for people to do, but you're not gonna go out and just burn building after building and hurt people constantly. A remarkable period. Wayne Miller is donating half the profits from the book to help burn victims. And next Tuesday night, the 19th, Miller will appear at Jack's Abbey Brewing in Framingham to discuss his book. Mark Robinson, the federal prosecutor in the case, says he still wonders if there were other people who helped facilitate the conspiracy, but who were never identified. And that is Chronicle for tonight. Thanks so much for joining us, everyone. I'm Anthony Everett. Have a good evening. Hope to see you back here again tomorrow night.